Hello, I am Stephanie Joy, the attorney at All Things Social Security and Joy Disability Law. Your video is about to start. I just wanted to remind you that if you click the join button below, you can learn more about the memberships offered at a very affordable price that can give you a little more direct attorney answers to your questions. Have a great day and enjoy the video. Hey, hey, good afternoon. It's almost early evening here. Um, you probably won't see this till morning. Um, someone asked about if the SSA only schedules a CE for physical when you are really hanging your hat on your mental health as being what keeps you out of all work. The question was why, you know, why would that be? And does that mean that the SSA believes your treating doctors, mental health doctors, and therefore is rolling with that? Not really. So let's just go over this a second. The CE exams generally, as I understand it, are when your own records do not have enough information to quantify you at a specific, whether it's diagnosis, but more so probably the severity, the symptoms and the nature of the limitations um, and, and the severity of those. So if your records are very complete and your doctors are very articulate, they might not need to do a CE exam to determine whether you are disabled or not disabled. The same thing would be for physical. Now there often is because medical providers tend to be really not the best recorders of things that are relevant to the SSA sphere in your case, but it wouldn't be unheard of to not have a CE exam on what you think is your biggest trouble. And that would be because your records spell the answers already. So there's no need for a CE. The other part of the question was, would they, uh, does that mean that the SSA agrees with my mental health doctors? Not so much. It just means that the SSA found that there was enough, they were complete um, to the extent where it could be determined what the diagnoses were, if any, and the level of symptomology and the functional limitations that stem from that. So, you know, if your doctors say things possibly inadvertently, not meaning anything negative in terms of your case or uh, diminishing the level of severity because they use certain terminology because they don't know what the SSA, uh, you know, criteria are. You know, it could be where they're totally agreeing with your mental health doctors that you have mild to moderate depression, anxiety, PTSD, and an occasional panic attack. Will that render you disabled from all jobs? Probably not. So, y y you know, them agreeing, them finding your providers to be credible doesn't mean that your providers def de defined you or described you in the records in a way that would suggest, you know, full head on disabled from 12,000 simple non-stressful, no public, no coworkers jobs. <laughs> so it's, it's, you can't really, you can't really quantify it as a yes or a no, they believe, they don't believe, or that it would necessarily be a positive or a negative because it really doesn't mean any of the above. So um, I hear somebody yelling out there. Um, it is a weekend after all, but anyway, so you're really not going to know until I, I hate to say it, you get your determination if it's initial or reconsideration or you get the ALJ decision. Um, it's unfortunate because I know it's stressful and you don't know what might be lacking. And, and of course, at this date still, we don't get to see the DDE, the disability determination explanation until we appeal for an ALJ hearing. So it, it would be, I, I know we're working as a collectively disability representatives and our, our advocacy uh, groups that do a lot of work with um, you know, the federal government trying to get laws passed or work with the SSA, you know, lobbying of sorts to get things to happen. But they are trying to get representatives like myself who work, you know, frequently with the SSA 
and have access to our client's electronic records once we are connected to our client. Trying to get us access to, if you're denied on initial, there's a DDE, Disability Determination Explanation, and it really goes line by line as to what they use to find the answer that they did, which of course would be very relevant if you're denied, um, but also kind of important if you're awarded. I mean, you, you don't need it exactly right then, but it might be nice to have. But they don't share that with us, that whole section. We get it, you know, when we appeal after recon denial, but for some reason, they don't want us to have it. And none of us, I don't think any of us understand why, because we use that to help get the missing evidence that maybe uh, that they were hanging their hat on for a denial that maybe we don't think was worthy of a denial. But, you know, if they, you know, they put you at light exertional when it should be sedentary and you're like, okay, so maybe you need an updated MRI or, you know, there's things that we can look at. Um, it, it's really unfortunate that they don't, have this transparency. It doesn't hmm, make sense, but that's their federal government for us. Um, once they get that for us, then we can see more from the mental health component, you know, or the physical component, because both, both are going to be in there. You know, the RFC results will be in there. The RFC that the SSA medical expert has qu quantified your capacities at, your maximum capacities that you can do sustained tasks at specifically. So uh, that is really helpful. And that is, you know, both the mental and the physical, but yeah, we don't get to see it yet. You know, it's unfortunate. I think I have a feeling we're going to, they're going to get it there. You know, like we will win that battle. It's just taking more years than I would care to acknowledge. All right, guys, I hope you have a wonderful, wonderful uh, rest of your day and I will talk to you later. Bye. Hey, so if the subject matter of the video you just listened to is of interest and you want more on it, stay tuned. Here's another one about the same topic, but a little bit different by now. Um, I had the um, challenge today of explaining to somebody the very high threshold of medical evidence that is needed for a mental health impairment that would rise to the level in and of itself of making someone disabled. Um, so excluding any physical impairments, let's for the moment assume there were no physical impairments and it's purely severe mental uh, health issues or condition or disorder. Um, and, and interestingly, I'm doing this on a day, uh, it is Memorial Weekend and I just want to wish everybody a very meaningful and memorable Memorial Weekend. Uh, I don't want to say happy Memorial Weekend. I think we've been saying that for too long and it seems a little inappropriate. But anyway, um, a good Memorial Weekend to everybody is my wish. Okay, so going back to it, the let's assume someone for the moment is under 50 because that's going to be where the highest burden is um, to prove someone is unable to do all of the occupations that exist in the national and regional economy in substantial numbers, because that is the burden. Okay, and there are no special little age-related um, loopholes, if you will, for those under 50. So if someone comes to me and has um, a mental illness diagnosis and they are sure, or it's their loved one perhaps that comes to me, they don't believe that person is gonna be able to sustain a job they've been trying perhaps and have been um, unsuccessful due to um, the symptoms of their disease or disorder or condition. Okay, so let's say it's schizophrenia. And I think we're gonna have, or we had a recent video on the listing level for that, but um, let's look at the, um, the evidence that would help show um, it could get someone to a listing level or the more traditional residual functional capacity method of proving disabled. A diagnosis will not do it. Um, if you're uh, thinking otherwise, watch the video on why a diagnosis will not do it, okay? Um, so there are, but there are ways, there's evidence that exists oftentimes for those with very severely symptomatic mental health condition. And these would include things like, um, 
and it's very, very, it's very, very um, acute evidence. Things such as durational um, partial hospitalization program that they go to multiple days a week, every week for as long as necessary. And again, if it becomes unnecessary, they that might mean that the condition is well controlled on medications and they are not disabled anymore. They're just impaired and it's treated and treated well. So current and ongoing partial hospitalization programs um, combined with any or all of the following, um, there may be relapses that require psychiatric admissions one to two um, times a year at a minimum. Um, could there be a year where that doesn't happen? Of course. So this is all very general, but um, inpatient psychiatric admissions, not the three-day check, but something more durational. Um, could it be a multitude of three-day checks? Yes, possibly. So remember, none of this is carved in stone, but I'm just referring to what would be the kind of evidence a lot of lawyers are going to be um, wanting if someone who's under 50 and has no physical problems. And even if they do have physical problems, but those are not disabling in and of themselves from all jobs, even sedentary. So if we're going just on the medical, partial hospitalization, um, repeat periodic inpatient psych admissions, um, the medications, that would be what we would see with such a disorder, let's say it's schizophrenia. Um, with a little psychosis, we would expect to see antipsychotics um, being taken and not being ignored. Um, I know sometimes people stop taking the medication because it doesn't make them feel good in a different way. Um, that can be a double-edged sword. Um, frequent uh, or not infrequent need to adjust medications because they cycle out of them. Um, they don't work for long. They might work sometimes and then they're not. That is a big sign of a person who has a very limited, there's limited control over his or her condition. Um, so that would be positive evidence, although it's not positive for the person's health, of course. So when I talk about everything, it's about the evidence and what makes good evidence does not necessarily, and usually does not mean um, that it's favorable for, for someone's you know, healthy forecast, unfortunately. That is the nature of this beast. Um, and forgive my hoarseness. I don't know if it's allergies or whatever. I, I don't smoke. <laughs> so it's not it's not a smoking voice. Um, although I did smoke when I was younger, stupidly, um, but it's been a good 20 years. Okay, what else with the mental health? Um, being willing and doing, going to at least weekly talk therapy with a trusted therapist. Um, sometimes they lose a therapist and they don't want, they don't like the next one. And then they go for a year without, that's not going to be helpful to a case. Um, particularly if going without, there's not a bunch of relapses as a result. So, you know, um, how badly off are they? That's what it, we're trying to show that the person can't work because they're not stable enough. If they are doing just fine, um, then they might be stable enough to go back to a simple uh, unstressful, uh, is any job really unstressful? That I would argue, but um, routine, one, two step direction, very simple, unskilled work. So it doesn't matter if you've had training in anything ever, okay? You don't have to have gotten through the eighth grade. Um, complying with the you know medications management um, reasonably well, and it's still not being well controlled. Um, other forms of evidence can be um, evidence that's not medical, but it's pretty objective. Like if there's been um, uh, brushes with the law due to um, impulsivity, lack of control, uh, poor judgment, poor insight, those um, arrests get documentation of that. And again, it's gonna have to be in the more current time frame. The treatment has to be current, period. It's gotta be now and going forward. It can't be something you point to four years ago to show that the person has the condition. The condition probably won't be the thing that's in dispute. Usually that's the easiest thing to prove as long as they you know, go to a doctor. Um, but it's that ongoing treatment that shows the continuing nature of how unstable, um, tenuous it is. 
if they have a very structured home environment where there's oversight over them, someone keeps an eye on them, that can be um, indicative of a person who needs to have that oversight, right? I mean, if you need to have oversight and supervision when you're not under the strains of working, when you're at home and you're not even, you don't have a job, um, what might that mean in terms of the supervision you'd need on a job? Because despite the fact that they say there are low stress jobs, we all know that just attending to work in a reliable fashion can be a level of stress um, on most people, uh, well dealt with by most people, but then when someone has struggles with that, that is um, a higher level of stress on them. Um, medications management, that would be the doctor who's doing the prescribing since a the therapist probably isn't. You're gonna want both. When it comes to a more severe mental illness, one that's actually in of itself making the person disabled versus reducing their capacity to do skilled work, work with others on a frequent basis, it'd have to be the one that takes out all jobs. Um, and that's the one that um, they can't do the things that every job entails, such as being able to interact appropriately with coworkers and supervisors. There, if there's a substantial loss in that ability, not just a mild loss where they have to keep it, you know, only occasionally they have to deal with them. If they can't even do that occasional, they're that tenuous, maybe that um, off the handle, um, unpredictable, that would be perhaps the type of um, level of symptoms that would cause someone to have substantial loss in the ability to interact with coworkers and supervisors. So it has to be a substantial loss in that ability. But if that's what the medical records are saying, um, or you know, when you ask the doctor, would he does he have a substantial loss in the ability to interact with others, not just the public and strangers, but coworkers and supervisors? It could be because um, a, a low threshold of tolerance for others. Um, depending on his mood, it could be severe moodiness, um, that impulsivity we talked about. Some people uh, may, for mental health reasons, lack a filter and the ability to, you know, not go off the handle, um, you know, when, when, the, when the impulse is there, the lack of control. Um, another requirement is that there has to be an ability to um, maintain a semblance of attendance to show up for work. If there are psychological symptoms that would prevent someone from showing up to work multiple times a month, or they're gonna go in very late, that might be something that um, interrupts and is a substantial loss of the ability to do that. Um, if a person can't um, adapt to like routine workplace changes, nothing major, but um, you know, when things change up at work and there has to be a change, maybe they move, you know, work, work um, spaces or, or a process in that one, two step process of a simple job. If the person would have a very difficult time and would not be able to perhaps make that adjustment um, without a big hubble and interrupting the whole workplace, that, that lack of ability to minorly adjust to the to typical adjustments that have to be made at work would be potentially something that would eliminate all jobs. So that's kind of so probably a, a video for a different day when we go through all of those things. But the point of this video is about the evidence needed to show that those things might not be available for a person. They might be substantially lost. Um, I think I was just talking about the legal ramifications. Uh, sometimes there's, there's there could be um, fighting, brawls, um, road rage, shoplifting. Believe it or not, um, if a person has, you know, one, two, more, um, because they're not able to control their decision making in a responsible manner, that can be a strong piece of evidence, even though that's not medical evidence. So that's. Um, a very good piece of non-medical evidence. Um, third party statements can be helpful. They're not medical evidence either. Um, and obviously when they're coming from family, there is that little edge of conflict. It's, it's allowed though, but it's just not gonna necessarily hold the same, you know, hold the same weight um, by the fact finder or the judge because you know, the family cares and the family's emotionally um, involved. Um, but there could be others. Like for instance, if you can get your hands on a coworker where they used to work and, and how that job ended, let's say it was because of a brawl. Let's say it's because uh, he would fly off the handle or let's say she would um, 
he or she would break down and cry or would be talking to themselves because they were hearing voices or seeing things. Third party statements as to what they witness, particularly if it's a non-family member, but it can also be family members. But the more you can get that's not family um, or not someone emotionally attached with a, you know, a conflict there um, can be helpful. So again, I, the, the need for the weekly therapy and the, the regular mental health treatment is very important, but just regular garden variety uh, counseling with medications management when all's going well, that is not going to be a winner. I think most of us would find because not to prove that the person is mentally disabled from all jobs. Okay. It has to be something more. It's got to be where that isn't enough. They still have to go to the hospital with these relapses, psychiatric admissions. It could be ER visits. It could be the police have to be called because the person's out of control. And then there's, there might be a, um, a hospital visit as a result or not. Um, it has really got to be really robust and current ongoing. If it's not current ongoing, then there's no evidence of a current ongoing severe problem. The belief will be that there's a problem, but guess what? Most, <laughs> most workers have mental health issues, I think, in this day and age. So you have to be able to set yourself apart as to why your mental health condition or your loved one's is so severe that they cannot sustain even the simplest, easiest job um, on a sustained basis. That means full-time and on an ongoing basis. And I wanna say the general rule would be six months for that. Um, so if they try and they keep getting the boot within you know, two, three months, um, that could be indicative, but it would be good if one can get the reason why the job didn't work, not from the person themselves necessarily alone, but from the, the employer. Um, Again, there's a lot of, it happens a lot where someone gets fired because of their attitude. And we're trying to show that it's not just attitude. It's it's a symptom of the medical condition and the fact that it's not well controlled. Um, okay, so mental health as a younger person, when that is the only thing you, you, you have, um, and even if it's not because just the way things go with the under 50 crowd, you know, if, if the physical condition is not very disabling, bedridden, wheelchair bound almost, um, the mental health will not push it over the edge unless it would probably in and of itself. That's how severe it's got to be. Now, when we're over 50, there are other rules in play so that someone doesn't have to be disabled fully by their mental, but the little bit that the mental reduces in their ability to do skilled work or unskilled work can make the difference. Um, that's a whole different issue though. I'm just talking about the evidence needed to show that it's a severe um, and disabling mental condition in and of itself, okay? Really, really major evidence, guys. It is huge, pardon my dog, buddy. Um, anyway, I hope that helps. If, if you haven't started to get this, but you know the shoe fits, you've got to start. You've just got to make it your full-time job. Get that treatment, 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 so that those documents are all going to be there in a year from now or six months from now. Um, and you know, we don't want to see people going into psychiatric admissions. Um, so I don't think it's impossible if they're now stable enough not to do that, but there's going to have to be evidence of the fact that it's very severe and this garden variety counseling every week or two isn't going to do it. So that counselor has got to be very astute about how much they have to be on top of you, how strong those medicines are, how difficult it still is, but you're maintaining. And a sheltered lifestyle, if you are um, well cared for in a sheltered home life with family um, or in a halfway house, because you can't do it on your own, that would be huge evidence too, that you need to be very sheltered. When you go out in public, perhaps you always have to have someone with you. But that's going to have to be described by the medical provider, not just you, because what we say and you say is not medical evidence. So we need these medical providers to be very articulate and care enough to share those facts, okay? And not to use the HIPAA carve out about psychotherapy records to avoid actually explaining the other things they're supposed to talk about, which is diagnosis, symptoms, um, mental status at every session. Those things are what can really... Um, bring forward a case and, and provide the evidence needed without the need for psychotherapy records um, 
of the details of the conversations, not necessarily, but they can certainly speak to if the person hallucinates, audio, visual, very, very important. Um, it's a big sign of instability. Okay, guys, um, if I think of any more, I'll put them together and share them to you. Be, be well now. And again, Memorial Weekend. I hope you have a good one. Hug those that are near you. Bye now.